yes. with mm -hmm. Debbie Folleron. Folar oh, how do you pronounce it? Mm -hmm. We don't really know, but we do answer to Folleron, Folleron, everything. Well, how do you pronounce it? Well, it depends on the country. <laughs> oh, God. Seriously. Yeah, really? Yeah. So, Folleron. Mm -hmm. Folleron, good. good. Okay, yeah, Folleron. That's that's, 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 mm -hmm. that's. Debbie, what do you do? I'm a translation professor, translation studies mm -hmm. at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what do you teach? I teach, well, I've taught a few different courses, but generally uh, mostly the technology courses. So that's mm -hmm. computer-assisted technology or translation environmental yeah. technology, if you want to call it that. Localization, project management, informatique et traduction. But then, in addition to more traditional, conventional translation, practical classes as well as translation theory. Okay, are you just a theorist, ac ac academic, or do you have professional experience? I have professional experience in a few domains. Um, I can give you a bit of a minimalist trajectory of, mm -hmm. of, of where I came from. Initially, I had no technical background, and I was studying. And working as a translator. Oh, we should make a point. You're mm -hmm. you're not Canadian. <clears throat> I'm not Canadian. Well, I am Canadian now, actually. Oh, yes. congratulations. Thank you. Okay. But you were brought up? In the United States. In the United States, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I began by always having an interest in languages because I heard my one living grandparent always speaking in Polish. In what? In Polish. Polish. Mm -hmm. And uh, okay. nobody ever wanted to really teach us the language, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, it, it always, it, it was part of my background, uh, I would say, on my maternal side. And so um, I uh, eventually ended up wanting to specialize in foreign languages and possibly teach them and ended up doing a uh, time abroad obligatory in France. That mm -hmm. was my first exposure to European culture and life. And then after that, <clears throat> after graduating the following year, I ended up in getting a job offer in Spain and moved to Spain and began, actually lived there for a 10-year period. So in Spain, I, once I learned the language, I was basically dr I drifted into um, bilingual administrative work and things of this sort, but mm -hmm. then um, always worked a, as, a, as a translator and eventually from Sevilla to Barcelona ended up in a shipping company, so okay. managing all the telecommunications at the time. So oh. yeah, that was, so I was part of the whole network, the telecommunications network. I said you were in growth. New York doing localization. That was after. Okay, so you've got lots of experience. background experience. Yes. Okay. So that was Spanish, and yeah. I, my, my way into localization, in fact, was on the receiving end when we first uh, received all the, all the computers and had the network, everything for the uh, uh, headquarters in France, we the, all the information was coming from the United States who, who in was, English. Who was we? Yeah. We, the company I was working for. Name? The name at the time was Name Spain. It yeah. was the representative of the company Marketing Department. Okay, very good. Yeah. All right. So they put me in charge of, of uh, telecommunications and, and had to set up the network because all the information was in English. All the resources were given to me. I learned on the spot. So when was that? That was the um, towards uh, the end of the 1980s. So that's real pioneering mm -hmm. in just figuring out how localization is going to work yes. with languages. And the impact that non-localized software has on people who need to use the software. So you're, def you're in software then when you At get to period, that stage, yes. yeah. Yes. So after that, um, when I moved back, the United States, and at that point, I decided that was, this would have been 1991. I was I um, decided to apply for the for advanced translation translation theory. It would have been uh, for masters and PhD, and, and that's how I ended up at the univers at Binghamton University. Right, and and right so as translation went, theory was taking off, so you I went from all the tech stuff into literary complete. Complete theory. Yeah. 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 You, so comparative you a, literature and an and epiphany or something or what? I love them all. Okay. I love all, <laughs> both areas. The theory, okay. the practice. Tell us about the PhD then. So the PhD that I worked on uh, was after after getting the certificates that were in place at the time for say, French, Spanish and, and Italian. 
um, in practical translation. Then I uh, decided to explore the uh, the Francophone drama and theater and performance that was um, happening in North Africa. So mm. that was, I focused on Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, obviously, and um, <clears throat> studied the way uh, translation was bringing theater, notions of theater from the outside, and how that was conjugated in local environments. So Algeria yeah. was began, beginning from Syria, Lebanon, coming through Egypt, and then and then how that worked in Algeria once French colonialism had, was playing a role, and then Tunisia with with some Italian, and Morocco with Spanish and French. So uh, and and then obviously that leads you to continually explore the. The, the wellsprings of all of these influences, mm -hmm. and part of that being indigenous, uh, the Berber, the Tamazight, and in, in, in all of North Africa, and it's just one thing leads to another. It's a wonderful, I think, trajectory. So, so you come out with a PhD in, in, in comparative literature okay. and translation studies theory. And then what do you and do? And then uh, fast forward a few months, and. We moved to New York City, and there, as a new graduate, <laughs> I don't know the city very well, and I uh, ended up first uh, getting a part-time job at New York University as an administrator, administrating, um, uh, well, as an administrative assistant, not in a director position, and then um, the which eventually led to me working full-time in a translation company, which I had applied for and got hired at okay. a translation company called Ericsson Translation. Just a little translation company. At the forefront of the capsules yes. And, yes. Okay. and everything else. So that was a wonderful, I always like to say that I did my second PhD so, so in forgive me, Translation You company. would have got paid there a lot, lot more than you get paid now. In academia? Yes. So why would anybody why would be an academic? The research. I missed, really? Yes, the research because it was that's an actually an interesting question because what I found doing my PhD and having so much cultural theory uh, that was starting to spring up at the time and have an impact on translation theory mm -hmm. um, that I was automatically perhaps it was because I had just I was freshly de had freshly defended my thesis mm -hmm. and it was. But when I went, went immediately into into practice and management, I was working as a language man, um, uh, technology yeah. translation technology manager at the company, and and that what seeing the different scenarios that were playing out. For example, in the '90s, you had the the issues of uh, former Yugoslavia, and you had Absolutely, and yeah. trying to bring translators in who um, who would state their bias and you could see that there were there were these the dynamics that we had talked about mm -hmm. in theory yeah. that were actually playing out in the ground yeah. for these projects all projects had some kind of um power <laughs> dynamic mm -hmm. to it and that that um i was starting to make those links and at a certain point but when did I you move to, to, to montreal then yeah so that would have been in 2003 june okay good yes and now i am full-time academic and you haven't gone back to professional there's no time. Practice. There's no time to really do that. To go Once back you're in academic, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But do you regret that? Becoming? No. Okay. I don't. Okay. I love working with my students. Yeah. I love being able to pass the torch on uh, a bit for some whatever because we get to learn on the spot everything, right? There wasn't. There yeah, wasn't sure. It's an exciting age to, to be there. Yeah. 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 I, I've seen you talking about minority languages as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Mm -hmm. So that interest has been there for a long time. In fact, some of my early papers when I went back to school for my graduate work um, had to do <coughs> with exploring the Romani language. Yeah. And I uh, was interested in some of the issues of standardization and uh, the different dialects um, and the fact that there is no nation state that is really backed uh, there hasn't yeah. been an educational infrastructure for the language learning, so my question I, obviously was, well, uh, when, when people write, um, what, how does translation materialize on the ground, right? And so... Is that tra translation into Romani from, or...? or well, that was or my right? question, yeah, okay. because everything was so visible with regard to uh, Romani communities, mm -hmm. and knowing that so many 
dialects up to 80 are, are spoken and used and that there is when you go for to into school and in a higher education you're not going to get it in a Romani dialect you're mm. going to get it in a nation state language right, yeah. right? Sure. so depending on what you write and where that translation need is or interpreting need is going to really um, change all these directions these flows of mm. translation so you generally when you look at the works the the like short stories, novels, they're, they're nation state languages. Sure. And the poetry is are, poetry are, is going to be in, in a dialect, whether you translate it into a Romani dialect or, or whether, or whether, or vice versa. But there's some, you have some interesting translation dynamics that I wanted to explore. Great. Yeah. And that's something that, yeah, I'm very passionate about. As if that were not enough, Debbie, you started a translation journal, mm -hmm. translation studies journal. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us about that? Right. So this journal, the idea came about... Like translation spaces? Yes. Well, wait, I was going to say this. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the idea came when, as especially with, with me having worked in the technology and seen it grow and, and see the impact that it had, but not from an academic uh, perspective necessarily, um, but on the ground. You, you know that there that there are implications for every technology and for the way it's used and 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 the more that these technologies were continuing to advance and develop and, and become embedded in everything we do I mean you don't even have to think of a, an immediate cause and effect relationship with the technology but think of even uh, the World Bank using technologies and their banking systems and, and all of these that have that it has a trickle-down effect where mm -hmm. where where economies that have absolutely nothing are going to have an impact, whether it be through credit, debt, whatever. It's it's just it's all over the place. And so, I wanted to explore or to have, to to see what what researchers were looking at translation in these translation spaces that were emerging in a globalizing, technologizing world, and what these social and cultural and technical how were all of these factors being conjugated. It's like having a little lens or a filter that you see the digital is a part of communication. Now you can't ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the journal's... Translation spaces. Basis. How long has it been going for? The first issue came out in 2010. Nine years. Yeah. Well done. Thank that's you. quite an achievement. <laughs> Finally, what kind of research do you think we, we need? In translation studies, I think... First of all, in terms of how it would take place, probably it needs to be interdisciplinary mm -hmm. moving forward. Uh, it has to include a, the digital life and world that we're living in, I think. Um, yeah, I, personally, I think it, there should be more um, trying to extract some of the insights that we've gained over the past 20, 30 years about translation processes and, and everything that we've been able to, to learn about translation um, to try and, and, and fit this in a contemporary environment so that we can yeah. move forward like everybody else has to do. I, I can't say that translation studies is unique in that yeah. way, right? Every, every discipline has to do that, but how can, how can we become meaningful in an age where translation is, is more and more prevalent, even though perhaps it's not as obvious as people may think. But, yeah. um, so looking for translation and seeing how um, how we can explain translation, also working um, if you're inclined toward activism, you know, yeah. trying to revitalize other languages. This is sure. all being done through digital technology. So. Great. That's Debbie, thank you very much. You're very thank welcome. You.